So what happens when glutathione is deficient? That's a really interesting perspective. There are a lot of disease conditions that are associated with low glutathione, and glutathione is really critical uh, for maintaining health. Glutathione itself is a powerful antioxidant. There's been research in glutathione, actually, it's been known for 100 years. But the technical ability to stu study oxidation stress has focused additional interest on this compound in the last few years. Uh, deficiency of glutathione is now being recognized in a wide range of conditions, including coronary artery disease, asthma, neurodegenerative diseases in both young people and old, uh, cognitive and behavioral problems, and various types of cancers. So it really covers a wide range of problems, and in the neurodegenerative disorders, that would include problems such as autism uh, in the young, and also Parkinson's disease in the older population. Uh, so the um, in the past eight years, the ability to administer glutathione has improved. And while plain glutathions have been available for over 40 years, and when I say plain glutathione, I'm talking about the uh, encapsulated form that you can purchase in the health food store that's not put into a liposome. Um, there have been no clinical studies with plain glutathione, and the answer is that the absorption from the gastrointestinal tract is not great. The glutathione is actually broken down. Um, and absorbed perhaps by the gastrointestinal cells, and there have been some report of benefit from that. But it doesn't really get a systemic um, improvement in glutathione. So in previously, the only clinical publications with glutathione were with IV glutathione, and it tended to give the clinicians a good idea of the potential of glutathione. And by this, uh, there was an early report in the 90s that showed that people with Parkinson's disease uh, improved after intravenous infusion of reduced glutathione, uh, but that was not a controlled study, and subsequent controlled study using placebos did not show any difference, which led, has led to a lot of confusion, and people have seen benefit from the IV infusion. Those benefits led to its use in a number of other conditions, including uh, children with autism, and again, there were sporadic uh, uh, anecdotal observations from many people that suggested there was uh, use for glutathione in support of that condition. So uh, in the past, supplying the building blocks of glutathione, cysteine, glutamine, and glycine, the three amino acids, has been used. And it turns out that cysteine is the rate limiting factor because it needs to be formed in the body, and I'm going to show you those pathways. And, NS and acetylcysteine, known as NAC, has been shown to help build glutathione, but we're now beginning to understand that some, in many conditions, the enzymes that put these three amino acids together don't always function properly. And so supplying the full molecule of glutathione has some advantages, especially in a number of conditions and early in the treatment of many problems with low glutathione. And so we'll mention that as we go along, and I'll try and show you the mechanism there. So liposome encapsulation of glutathione has initiated a new wave of interest in uh, supporting glutathione via an oral ingestion. And we now have a clinical study that documents that it can increase glutathione. And this was done in children um, diagnosed as having autism. And it showed that this group of children, it compared them to the use of a topical preparation of glutathione. And while both preparations showed some benefit in producing the metabolites, only the oral liposuitical glutathione uh, showed an increase in the plasma level, that's from the blood of glutathione, and in fact took these, the group of children from low glutathione up to uh, normal, although it was at the lower end of normal, they, they, the average went up to the normal range. So it's really quite fascinating uh, to see that we can now supply glutathione and not only get into the um, blood, but we can also get directly into cells, and I'll show you research which has been done that uh, demonstrates that uh, the liposomal form liposuitical glutathione can increase glutathione in cells. 
So the liposome that we're talking about is composed of a, a lipid layer on the outside, and this helps uh, form kind of a small circle, a sphere, inside of which is the reduced glutathione. Glutathione in the active state is then protected, and the liposome itself is uh, absorbed out of the upper part of the stomach um, readily, and um, is then carried through the mucous membrane into the lymphatics, leaving the stomach that leads to the upper part of the venous system returning blood uh, to the um, heart and lungs and brain. And so it's bypassing the liver and not having to go through the lower digestive area. And we have data that's uh, in progress in studies that show that uh, both heart and brain have uh, increased levels of glutathione in animals after ingesting the uh, this form of liposomal glutathione for two weeks in their water. A published study done by a researcher named Gail Zivok, who had published articles on uh, glutathione and calling that the uh, elephant in the room when talking about Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, glutathione is deficient in the, the cells in the brain that are responsible for forming dopamine. And after contacting Dr. Zivok, she said to let her check out her uh, the liposomal liposomal glutathione in her system, and she had shown over here on the left hand side that plain unformulated glutathione could replace the deficient glutathione in the cells in her cell culture using 500 micromolar amount of uh, plain glutathione. Now the cell culture system she used is uh, astrocytes and neurons that are in cell culture. And she then took the liposomal glutathione, liposuticle glutathione, and found it took only five micromolar to restore the glutathione levels inside of these cells. And um, so she then went on to write an article describing the um, findings, which you see down below the reference. And um, if you would like the whole article, uh, you can contact me and uh, we can supply you with the whole article. It's really um, a, a real scientific publication for those of you who are scientists, and it um, gives uh, some excellent background on the absorption. It shows that the glutathione in these liposomes are entirely encapsulated in the liposomes and then they are in turn entirely ingested into these uh, astrocyte cells. These are astrocytes and neurons or brain cells. And so it uh, helps support these brain cells very efficiently. So in general, glutathione is known as an antioxidant, a detoxifier, and also a critical component of immune function. Uh, Dr. Oz did several segments on glutathione on his TV shows and has referred to Glutathione is a superhero of antioxidants, the great protector and the mother of antioxidants. Um, the reason that th this particular molecule works so well in the body is related to this active uh, site here, a sulfur molecule, which is prominently displayed in the middle of the glutathione molecule. It is actually uh, part of a cysteine molecule, which is attached to glycine on one end and glutamine on the other. And this molecule is able to donate its hydrogen and its electron. And when that happens, uh, that's uh, a process that's uh, called uh, reduction. The molecule itself has some attributes which, once inside the cell, it uh, can resist digestion. There are active enzymes that break down a lot of peptides inside the cell because they don't want random peptides floating around. But glutathione is fairly resistant inside the cell where glutathione gets broken down is on the outside of the cell there's an enzyme called GGT, uh, glutamyl, uh, gamma glutamyl transferase, which breaks down the molecule into its component parts and then it needs to be reassembled inside the cell. So that is both a time consuming and energy consuming and enzyme requiring step and we'll touch on that. So when the glutathione is in the reduced active state, it's called GSH. In the oxidized state, there's a double bond that is formed in the middle between the two forms of uh, glutathione. This should be a double bond right here. And it's stable as an oxidized glutathione. 
So there are enzymes that call glutathione reductase, which when active can return, restore this complex molecule back into its two components and restore the function of glutathione with, without having to rebuild the whole molecule. And that's one of the big uh, functions of uh, glutathione is its ability to be restored back to the reduced state. The, um, this configuration of glutathione has got several attributes I'll show you in that it interacts with enzymes. One, the peroxidase enzyme to help um, um, restore hydrogen peroxide and the hydroxyl radical back to water. And it also interacts with a set of enzymes called glutathione S transferases, which hook glutathione up to toxins and account for its uh, detoxification qualities. Now, it took me a long time to understand oxidation and reduction. When a penny is old and it gets uh, oxidized, it loses its luster, as you see on the left here. This is an old penny, and here's a picture of a new penny. I should have put a new penny into this picture, and I will for the future, uh, just for the example. Another way to look at oxidation reduction is the loss of this hydrogen and the electron with it um, from water ends up forming what's called a hydro hydroxyl radical. And um, this radical wants to become stable again, so it'll pull a hydrogen from the surrounding enzymes or membranes and cause them to become altered and they don't function. So you can see in this penny, we put some liposuitical glutathione on um, an adjacent penny that was oxidized. And this is at the zero point. And then an hour later, it starts, you start to see a little more luster. And then um, it's much brighter two hours later. And the point here is that this oxidized penny is being restored to its reduced shiny state. And here you see this again. Uh, the hydroxyl radical, if you can donate a hydrogen and an electron from glutathione, I've spelled it backwards so it's GSH here, it'll restore this molecule back to water so the hydroxyl's been reduced and is now stable as water. So there's two ways to make glutathione in cells. The new de novo synthesis, which uh, requires the production of uh, an enzyme to hook glutamine and cysteine together, and then glycine is added to make glutathione. The second way is by recycling glutathione from the oxidized form. This form plays a major role in maintaining adequate glutathione in cells. If either method of producing glutathione is lost, and there's a number of reasons why this can happen. The level of glutathione will decline in the cells, and this will lead to oxidation stress. So as the cell becomes more oxidized, the glutathione is lost. That's actually the way scientists define oxidation stress, is by the availability of reduced glutathione and or the ratio of GSH to GSSG. So that um, gives you the background on uh, how scientists look at oxidative stress. So where do these free radicals come from in the, in the cell? In, in the cell, you have your nucleus, cell membrane, and uh, the mitochondria. And this is a focal point of energy production in the cell. It's also a focal point of iron metabolism and where cadmium can be absorbed, as well as other toxins such as uh, mercury. And in, uh, the production of uh, energy free radicals when uh, the oxygen is used in the production of energy and free radicals can be produced and they are produced primarily in the in the mitochondria the site of um, energy production and also where a lot of our enzymes for detoxification are produced so because the metals are in there uh, such as mercury they put exposed cells uh, to mercury in cell culture and then look to see where this uh, mercury was found. They found 8% in the uh, general part of the cell, 36% was stuck in the membrane of the nucleus of the cell, and 48% was stuck in the cell wall, I mean the membrane of the mitochondria, which means that the mitochondria are undergoing oxidation stress and damage um, from the mercury and contributing to the production of these excess free radicals and oxidation stress. So this shows you how metals and other toxins can produce uh, an increased number of free radicals that will put increased stress on the production of glutathione. 
glutathione is actually produced out here in the, what's called the cytosol, the liquid part, the watery part of the cell, and then there's an active pump that carries glutathione right into the mitochondria. And it's the availability of glutathione in the mitochondria that uh, control um, the function of the mitochondria and also a process where they can become uh, self-digested and or lead to the whole di self-digestion of the whole cell. So glutathione plays a major role in maintaining our cell function. And the free radicals that we're talking about that are formed from uh, exposure to metals, for example, inside the mitochondria. This is all, the left side here is all happening inside the mitochondria. Uh, produces this OH radical I mentioned, the hydroxyl, uh, which is kind of like an O if you got hit by that in the reactive nitrogen species coming from nitric oxide, which is produced in the mitochondria also. It becomes peroxynitrite, which is a very powerful uh, free radical also, and that's kind of like the exclamation, oh no, when you get hit. The hypochlorous acid over here on your right is formed by myeloperoxidase. This occurs around cells during inflammation. It's released by the neutrophils as part of the defense against infection and can also probably happen during inflammation in general. So each one of these, amazingly, each one of these can um, be neutralized directly by glutathione and or by interaction with its enzymes such as glutathione peroxidase. So we talked about uh, the work that glutathione does in reducing these free radicals and the energy dependent pump. So it turns out that some of the inflammatory cytokines, particularly the ones known as uh, TNF, which is released during a lot of inflammation, will target the mitochondria and increase the production of free radicals. So now you see where toxins can cause free radical production, inflammation can cause that, and that's uh, where I, it, inflammation and uh, oxidation uh, tend to occur together. So in understanding the deficiency, you need to understand where it's made. In a review of papers, incidentally, on autism from uh, just this year has concluded that more research is needed to demonstrate the clinical problems that occur from problems in the glutathione production pathways. So the pathways they're talking about are methylation, uh, the gene defects of methylation, such as the uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme that's part of the uh, methylation cycle, and the trans transsulfuration pathway from which cysteine is made, and they're even now articles showing that the enzymes responsible for putting those three amino acid precursors together can become deficient due to oxidation stress and other mechanisms, which I'll show you. So these uh, enzymes, the very enzymes that are making glutathione uh, can be blocked by a variety of causes, including uh, mercuric oxide, for example, can block this uh, glutathione synthesase. I'll, I'll show you those enzymes in just a minute. So the methylation cycle, when I first saw it, I was really confused by it. I hope to show you it's not as complicated as it looks. The production of many components of the body function, including homocysteine and ethadenethyl methionine, CME, are produced off of this cycle. And CME is involved with um, just a huge range of uh, mechanisms in the body, including protein production and contributing to uh, neurotransmitters and that sort of thing. So the methylation cycles become the prototype example of how gene defects affect function. So in its simplest form, we're in the methylation cycle, we're going to go from uh, methionine uh, to homocysteine. And while it sounds like a big deal, you're basically moving this carbon around to different components, CME, s cell, homocysteine, then to homocysteine itself. And as this cycle goes around, it's got to have a complete action to form these different materials. Um, and where a gene defect has been clearly described, the uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase uh, gene, if it's not present or functioning properly, you're not going to be able to hand off this uh, carbon group, this methyl group from methylfolate, either not form methylfolate and or not uh, hand it off. Um, to B12, and these are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, and the 
abbreviation you see is SNPs. People refer to gene SNPs. They're talking about these single amino acid changes that prevent these genes from functioning adequately. So when the whole system is functioning, uh, this methyl uh, B12 will then be turned over to methionine and the whole uh, process will go again. Then as it, the cycle is going around from homocysteine, it can be um, converted into cysteine with the help of vitamins B6 and magnesium, and that's why these vitamins and others are important. Then gamma cysteine, uh, glutamyl cysteine ligase and glutathione synthase uh, come into play also. And um, here's the full word, the GCL is glutamyl cysteine ligase. It used to be called uh, GC synthetase. It's now changed this ligase to allow it to not be too confused with the glutathione synthase molecule. Uh, enzyme. And that's the one that adds the third amino acid. And this synthase can be blocked by a number of damaging steps, including uh, the uh, met metallic form of mercury that uh, has been shown to inhibit uh, glutathione synthase inside astrocytes. Again, we're talking about brain, those brain cells. And so the formation of glutathione can be blocked in a number of spots at the MTHFR, um, alcohol and other oxidative stressors can block the handoff from B12. Um, and now we see that uh, metal toxins can block the function of one of the enzymes that puts glutathione together. So taking the precursors such as NAC do not always end up being converted to glutathione. And we have uh, research uh, related to this uh, in progress and uh, so you might want to check back uh, perhaps uh, to one of the websites that I work with, and I'll certainly pass this on to um, at Great Plains um, when the uh, research is published. Um, that'll show how effective that providing liposuitical glutathione uh, can uh, be in restoring the whole molecule here. So a lot of tribute, a lot of credit really needs to go to Jill James for introducing this to the uh, physicians who are interested in these areas back in her uh, 2004 paper. And um, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but those of you who's been dealing with autism know that it's been demonstrated that uh, SAMe can become deficient along with decreased cysteine leading to decreased glutathione in children with autism. One intriguing fact that I've run across is the fact that another block can occur from the deficiency of glutathione in this handoff from methylfolate to methyl B12. It turns out that you need glutathione to protect the um, intermediate step of called glutathionyl cobalamin while it's receiving this uh, carbon for the methyl B12. And if you're, I think that's one spot that's been overlooked in terms of when individuals are low in glutathione, that cycle is blocked and they're not able to make, sustain and make glutathione efficiently. So Again, it's another reason why supplying the whole molecule may have significant advantages for maintaining the uh, cell function. And so that uh, that will bypass the need to construct glutathione from the precursor amino acids. I, I want to mention just briefly the G6PD enzyme that you see as far as the uh, pentose phosphate pathway for making NADPH to help return the oxidized form of glutathione to reduce glutathione. This is that second step that I mentioned to you uh, that you need to maintain glutathione. So even if you had adequate nor, uh, production of new glutathione, if this is blocked, you get into trouble and G, G6PD is uh, both present in uh, people of Mediterranean, North African descent, uh, the deficiency of that, a gene SNP causes G6PD to not function as efficiently. And um, there's a, you know, Pythagoras did not have this enzyme functioning well, and so uh, his exposure to fava beans uh, caused him problems. And it's uh, a nice little bit of history in there, but it emphasizes the importance of keeping um, glutathione regenerated uh, reduced from the glutathione reductase enzyme. So here's the whole pathway. 
Uh, we're going to see GCL putting glutamine and cysteine together to make glutamyl cysteine, and then uh, glycine is added by the synthase enzyme. You see glutathione peroxidase over here, which is going to uh, take your peroxides back to water. And you see the um, oxidized form of glutathione, GSSG, being reduced by the glutathione reductase in combination with uh, uh, G6BD uh, forming NADP to fuel this uh, production of reduced glutathione. And I uh, want to show you there's some um, vitamins that are important in this. And um, these will show up on your various uh, uh, panels that you do that show inefficient uh, production of various materials. They'll show a need for certain uh, vitamins. And, um, and you'll see that B5 is needed up here for the GCL function. B1 is needed in that pentose phosphate pathway. Zinc is a very important component of glutathione reductase, as well as niacin and B2. Selenium is a really important uh, uh, component of the glutathione peroxidase enzyme. And selenium should be supplemented only at the low doses, 100 or 200 micrograms, according to how, whatever dose your physician requires. Excess selenium can become toxic, so you don't want to over um, supplement with selenium. Uh, it turns out that during oxidation stress, the stenzyme pathway is controlled. The thermostat for controlling the production of glutathione is called NERF2. And I'm going to spare you the long term for that. You can look it up as NERF2. Um, and it acts like the thermostat on the wall when the heat, um, to heat the room, when it gets too cold, the thermostat turns on and produces more heat. In this case, when oxidation stress increases inside the cell, NERF2 is made in a larger amount and it's also released in a larger amount. And it's a it work goes then goes to the nucleus. It's a transcription factor. And then NERF2 can turn the nucleus tell the nucleus to turn on the production of these enzymes and the production of more glutathione as well as a whole array of other antioxidants. The whole Antioxidant response elements, as they're called, is controlled by NERF2, including the production of the GST enzymes, the glutathione S transferases, that help with detoxification. And it's recently been shown by an article by a group at Emory, uh, led by Ann Fitzpatrick. And here's the uh, PubMed uh, identification number if you want to look it up um, in the PubMed. And this is the number that you can just plug into the PubMed search engine, and it'll give you the whole article. Um, I'll give you the reference, and um, uh, what's really interesting here is that when um, there's under severe oxidation stress, as described in children with chronic asthma, the NERF2 function is blocked because the, while it's being made, its function is inhibited because NERF2 has become modified on its way to the nucleus, and it will no longer tell the nucleus to turn on these enzymes, and so this lightning strike here is meant to show that these enzymes are blocked and you can then not make adequate glutathione. When this happens, I've looked at some data that shows that when this happens that you're, it, many people with that problem will be entirely dependent on that glutathione reductase, just working as, mad, as hard as it can to, to maintain the glutathione. And this happens in children with asthma in their lungs and uh, Fitzpatrick and her group has shown that uh, that's why they cannot break the cycle of requiring uh, medications for their asthma, because she's done a lot of work and has demonstrated that asthma in the extracellular lung fluid is deficient, and it uh, blocks the ability for dilating those bronchioles as well as for maintaining immune function in the cell. So this, I think we're going to see more and more of this uh, NERF2 burnout, is what she calls it, in a number of diseases. It's not established firmly in all diseases yet, but it's been shown in severe asthma, chronic obstructive lung disease, and in age-related vascular disease in animals, but it's also being speculated on in neurodegenerative diseases and may help explain why some conditions end up with low glutathione in the brain and they cannot restore the glutathione. So I mentioned that in the extracellular lung fluid, the um, 
glutathione, the reduced glutathione is maintained at a level 140 times higher than that in plasma in the same individual. And it's primarily in the reduced uh, state. So um, it emphasizes the importance of glutathione in the lung and why these children stay uh, stuck with chronic uh, inflammation. And I've had a very nice experience in using the uh, liposuitical glutathione in support of problems such as uh, chronic sinusitis and uh, asthma in uh, both adults and children. Uh, but sometimes it can take longer. I've had some really nice results in many people but uh, very quickly, but in others it took longer, and I suspect that that system just takes a while to be able to be turned back on. So in the lung, uh, glutathione is important for maintaining the function of nitric oxide, which is a um, dilating molecule for in asthma. And the GSNO is much more stable than the plain NO I showed you earlier that can turn into a free radical. Just briefly, in the lung, inflammation will increase the production of nitric oxide. And with glutathione present, it will lead to bronchodilation. When you don't have the glutathione, that's when you end up with problems uh, that peroxynitrite and lack of glutathione contribute to both the asthma and um, chronic inflammation. So we're going to run briefly through the um, what happens in the lung. Uh, normally oxygen in the little alveolar sac is being um, transported or, or just carries naturally across through the extracellular lung fluid in the lining membrane. And here inside the lung, I'll show you an alveolus with uh, uh, macrophage cells. And these are big cells that go around and pick up debris and clean that debris and bacteria and whatever else is coming in the lung. And as long as they're functioning, you don't have inflammation or problems. And here's an example of a big macrophage even eating an active uh, inflammatory cell, a neutrophil, uh, after it's done its work. And this is what helps contribute to calming lung inflammation. And they demonstrated this uh, mechanism occurred. Um, the engulfment of these apoptotic, that means uh, cells that are self-destructing after they do their job, that's what they're designed to do. And the macrophage is designed to clean that up. And it reduces uh, lung inflammation. And in these animals, they've got a single exposure to you know, dirty uh, barn air. So here's um, your cells, your macrophage, maybe an eosinophil that uh, is part of the allergy response. A little piece of debris comes in, and the macrophage comes along and chews it up, and it uh, gets rid of it. The neutrophils, which are sitting out here like the cavalry over the crest of the hill waiting for any problems, uh, stay quiet. They don't need to be there. When debris is not picked up and it sets off and inflammatory response, the neutrophils come uh, piling in and uh, set off a big inflammatory problem and you get swelling of these membranes and the oxygen won't diffuse in properly anymore and that's when people feel a really short of breath. At the same time, CO2 won't diffuse out. But that's why it's really important in the lung uh, to maintain normal lung function and you don't want the swelling. And so in the past it has been thought that the lung was a site of they call it privileged immune function. It's uh, what they're really describing is efficient macrophage function um, that uh, keeps uh, the inflammatory reaction from occurring. Here in this example, when, if the eosinophil picks up the debris, it will set off the allergic reaction and call in those neutrophils. So that's a non-allergic, a non-infection, but being responded to as if it is creating this big inflammatory response. And it turns out that oxidized LDL plays a big role in compromising the function of these macrophages. And this uh, picture is taken from a, a, a longer, uh, a different presentation on um, atherosclerosis, which has a, a similar mechanism involved with the function of the macrophages. Back to the lung, in the extracellular lung fluid we just talked about, when you smoke or get exposed to smoke, there's a compensation reaction initially. Here's your control level of glutathione in millimolars inside the, the lung fluid. And people who smoke or get exposed to smoke, they will compensate and increase their glutathione initially. And everything's fine until that ability to increase the glutathione. And this is a general concept that I think we need to 
think about that uh, that's why people are healthy and then they get sick. And some people are able to overcome that and restore their glutathione, but there are conditions like HIV in which the glutathione becomes deficient and stays deficient. And we have an upcoming uh, paper on that. And people that require lung transplants have even lower glutathione. People with cystic fibrosis uh, have an even lower glutathione. And I've been privileged to follow uh, a couple of children with cystic fibrosis that have been using uh, liposomal liposuitical glutathione for uh, almost eight years now. And on the one child that presented with lung problem, the other with GI tract problem, they both returned to normal function and normal growth and um, have maintained that as long as they're taking the liposomal liposuitical glutathione. Um, so somehow that's supporting the glutathione in their lungs. We've not had research uh, yet describing that, but we now know how it gets into the macrophages so well that uh, certainly one mechanism. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis, even lower, and then the severe um, acute respiratory distress syndrome that's almost rock bottom. Um, and it shows you the kind of progression of lung problems is associated with a progression loss of glutathione. And then I mentioned that Fitzpatrick article. So oxidation of lipids, especially lipoprotein of uh, cholesterol, the low density lipoprotein of cholesterol, occurs if glutathione is deficient. And uh, this was described in a paper um, published uh, review, that reviewed the properties of liposomal glutathione as a both antioxidant and antiatherogenic prop, uh, material. So an LDL cholesterol, which uh, we're talking about now, cholesterol in your blood, um, there's a protein in there called ApoB, and when that gets damaged from oxidation, uh, antibodies can pick it up, and you can now monitor oxidized LDL. They do this in uh, cell culture they, by adding copper sulfate. In other words, adding another metal into the blood will increase the production of oxidized LDL. This occurs uh, through a reaction similar to the what's called the Fenton reaction, if you're a biochemist, in which uh, iron becomes oxidized and uh, produces um, these uh, hydroxyl radicals. So liposomal glutathione uh, was shown to prevent the oxidation. Here's uh, blood uh, without, um, let's use the lipid peroxides, without uh, glutathione and control liposomes had a lot of oxidation, but the oxidation was reduced by 90% with the use of the liposomal glutathione. And um, there's your reference down below. This is another article for physicians. I think we all are interested in this. This is information dense, science dense, but it's def definitely worth reading. It taught me a lot about the me basic mechanism of atherosclerosis. Is really, and it explains why there's published studies showing that people with atherosclerosis, uh, low glutathione is a predictor progression of atherosclerosis, even in apparently healthy people. Oxidized LDL can be found in the atherosclerotic plaque in the artery, and um, also in the smooth muscle um, uh, around uh, that's, that is around the, uh, this is an artery that's been cross-sectioned so you can see it, and here's the plaque that's filled with oxidized LDL. Here's an artist's representation of what you're looking at. And you can see these are macrophages out here that are designed to help clean all this up. And here the macrophages in there have been overwhelmed by the oxidized LDL. It actually becomes a toxin. Uh, I'm going to stop for a second. And I realize I went further than I intended to. I meant to stop and look at a couple of questions. Let me, let me look at a couple of questions here that are back on the, uh, well, here's endothelial dysfunction. Well, we're right at that. And would it show up as reduced blood levels of myeloperoxidase? It does if you can measure myeloperoxidase uh, because it will help calm the inflammatory mechanism related to that. And we've got uh, data that's uh, going to be published demonstrating that we reduce the cytokines that are a production in the macrophages and PMN, uh, polymorphic nuclear cells, and dendritic antigen presenting cells. Uh, during inflammatory infected situations. And then here's another question. Do both uh, 
MTHFR C677T and the A1298C affect the methionine cycle. Certainly the well-known one is the C677T and it definitely does. I think there's still some confusion about the A1298C and when you see the lab report it, it says it generally does not affect it but I have seen it a couple of patients that it seemed that they were having trouble um, with glute low glutathione function and um, so the uh, there's a, we're going to talk about towards the end um, one of the um, assay methods that you can look at the metabolites that would be elevated if the glutathione wasn't uh, functioning properly. Can glutathione improve endothelial dysfunction and would that, uh, oh yeah, the uh, peroxidase question. Yes, um, it, it appears to do that and, and um, in the study that is published uh, by um, Rosenblatt, if you can't read this, it's right at the bottom of my screen, atherosclerosis 2007, uh, page 195. Um, and if you find the abstract and you want the whole article, just contact me. Uh, so here's some uh, macrophages grazing on the surface of an endothelial cell uh, in cell culture. And you can see how some of these are diving down. It turns out that these used lipids inside the cell are actually released at the bottom part of the cell in the artery. So that it's not released out into the blood directly, but underneath the cell. And so the macrophages dive down in there and uh, clean up from the bottom. And that's why they can accumulate in the undersurface of the endothelial lining and create the plaque. And the oxidized LDL is taken up into the macrophage cell by a scavenger called CD36. We'll touch on this later. But the oxidized LDL is then taken up in the foam cell or a cell that becomes foamy if it's not metabolized properly. And that's there's a lot of research coming out on the metabolism of cholesterol is occurring inside the macrophages and they play a big role in that, you know, they are um, endothelial cells to metabolize cholesterol also, but the macrophage plays a big role. And when they're not functioning properly, you can end up with um, a plaque. So the foam cell then is accumulating under the artery lining and they can pile up and they can become unable to move modified low-density lipoproteins alters actin, and that's the biochemical mechanism for muscle contraction and motion. And that's why they pile up down there. And will begin to alter the shape of the artery and can lead to a rupture. So the presence of glutathione helps maintain, oh, and they showed that, the other thing that um, they showed in this study, which is uh, critical, is that the enzyme glutathione peroxidase that turns um, the hydroxyl radical and hydrogen peroxide back into water is found in the LDL complex. That big cage that I showed you earlier that's filled with cholesterol it also contains uh, glutathione peroxidase. And um, when glutathione is low, that's when the oxidized LDL can be formed and the macrophage can't uh, take care of it. Now, um, it's inter an interesting article that I ran across that puts this into a category that affects all of us is that the increased amount of air pollution from traffic will increase the amount of oxidized LDL in people with, they use people with diabetes type 2 because they're more prone to, they have a decreased uh, glutathione function, they're more prone to form oxidized LDL. And what they showed that uh, the, each doubling in distance away from major roadways is associated with a significant decrease in the carbon load in the macrophages in the airway. And they also showed that that correlated with um, the degree of oxidized LDL in the blood, meaning the closer you are to the freeway, the more um, carbon particles you may have in your lungs and the more oxidation in your blood. Now they haven't showed that this directly correlates with heart disease or anything like that, but it does show that we are all subject to increased oxidation stress in the modern world. 
Here's an interesting study done in central Croatia from 2009 to 2011. They enjoyed a lot of um, improvement in their roadways during that time, and uh, somebody got the idea to measure the lead level in honey uh, from these areas. And so they found that from 2009, the honey had about 91 micrograms per kilogram. And as the roadways and the uh, increased urbanization of this uh, countryside increased, each year it went up until it was, um, looks like, four times higher two years later. So there's certainly, I guess, equal opportunity for all of us to accumulate toxins. Lead is known to deplete uh, glutathione and to increase oxidation stress also. There's a graphic representation of the increased amount of uh, lead in honey in Croatia in that time period. This is really, to me, a really fascinating example because so often what happens is you find the presence of the toxin at, at the time you're looking at it, but there's no easy way to look at the specimens, excuse me, at the, at the uh, what it was at um, earlier. And so as the roadways improved, uh, they could look at uh, stored honey and see these differences. It seems like a, a jump, but it turns out that diesel exhaust uh, production of uh, you know, a product of pollution it can cause changes in the brain also. So the microglia activation, for microglia are macrophages in the brain, some of which are dedicated to the brain and, and stay there for long periods of time. And so when they get activated, that means that they're undergoing inflammation that can lead to neuroinflammation that can lead to oxidation of dopamine, which can become uh, damaging and toxic to the cells. So there was the, the other finding was this IL-6, which is a inflammatory hormone, interleukin-6, uh, was increased. And that's one that's associated with inflammation also. But the bottom line is that there's generalized neuroinflammation found um, in animals exposed to uh, diesel exhaust. So the midbrain area showed the most response, um, but uh, diesel particles administered deep into the trachea will increase the tumor necrosis factor alpha TNF. That's another indicator of uh, inflammation. So somebody earlier asked um, about myeloperoxidase, and this is the type of thing that's uh, going to accompany the increased myeloperoxidase is increased uh, TNF, increased IL-6. In both the whole brain, but also in the substantia nigra, this is an area of the brain where the cells are deeply, uh, darkly uh, stain containing a lot of dopamine, and they're subject to oxidation damage. And this uh, lack of oxidation damage and lack of glutathione has been identified in the substantia nigra of people with Parkinson's disease as the initial uh, component of uh, the first thing they could find in people who had Parkinson's and then passed away, and they were able to, in various stages of this disease, from other reasons, and they were able to correlate that with a loss of glutathione. So if you add lipopolysaccharide, which comes along with bacteria, then you get a synergistic, uh, amplified um, production of these inflammatory uh, mediators. Superoxide is another inflammatory media, uh, excuse me, another uh, free radical. It's just an, a singlet oxygen, but it will then go on to form um, hydrogen peroxide, and if there's metals present, we'll create those free radicals we discussed earlier. So this shows you how um, exposure to pollutants can cause problems. We talked about low glutathione in uh, the brain cells, and uh, Le uh, Gail Zivok's work I mentioned earlier, in which she, in talking about glutathione and Parkinson's disease, asked the question, is glutathione, glutathione the elephant in the room? And I think we're going to find that glutathione is uh, the elephant in the room in a wide range of neurodegenerative problems. Um, it's not been as well defined in uh, conditions such as autism, but I'm sure that that's going to be a contributing factor. And also in these conditions, when you're low in glutathione, your macrophage cells can't function as properly and control the inflammation, so it's understandable how you might have inflammation in other parts of your body. 
including the gut, which is a site both for oxidation stress and has a lot of bacteria and other stimulus stimuli coming through there. So in uh, neuropsychiatric problems, major depression, bipolar disease, and schizophrenia, low glutathione has been identified on uh, post-mortem examination in the prefrontal cortex of individuals with these problems. Here's your prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is where a lot of uh, assembly of information and intelligence occurs and, and also uh, impulse control uh, as an intern. Uh, never forget uh, seeing a, a young man, probably my age at the time, who had been involved in a car accident and had significant damage to his prefrontal cortex. And while I didn't follow him uh, during his extended stay in the hospital, uh, the tales of his antics on the floor because he no longer had any impulse control, although he had coordination and intelligence, um, were, were funny but, but terribly tragic um, due to damage, selective damage to the prefrontal cortex. Um, so in normal glutathione um, metabolism, pyroglutamate, which is available on the organic acid test from Great Plains, I mentioned there, there were markers that are out there that show the function of glutathione. Um, a uh, enzyme will turn the glutamyl cysteine uh, into um, pyroglutamate, which reflects ox oxoproline, and will give you an indicator of the um, adequacy of glutathione in that system. So uh, that's one way to monitor uh, your glutathione levels. And um, also, a caution about the use of acetaminophen because it will uh, get turned into a metabolite whose abbreviation is up here, um, will cause um, a significant increase in the pyroglutamic uh, acid production. So uh, blockage of the function of um, uh, glutathione is not being made if the glycine is low due to illness or fasting and that this will turn on the enzymes that form the oxoproline and increase the pyroglutamic uh, acid. Um, glutathione is used up by these high, a high level of this uh, metabolite and it inhibits the enzymes that recycle glutathione, as I mentioned earlier, the importance of the recycling of glutathione. And um, there's a lot of conjecture about the role that acetaminophen may play in creating neurodegenerative problems. And many papers written about it at, at this point at, at both the cell level as well as epidemiologic association with neurodegenerative conditions. And so this is a, uh, a way that this uh, problem can be monitored. And here's the uh, reference for an article on this from 2006 in which they show this increased production of pyroglutamic acid secondary to um, exposure to acetaminophen. And it doesn't have to be a single huge exposure. There have been cases where people were taking enough to affect this uh, cycle on a chronic basis. Um, and there's some tragedies that occur with this, in, especially in young women of college age, where they may uh, want to go out and celebrate with their friends using some alcohol in anticipation of a headache, um, they will um, take acetaminophen ahead of time so they've compromised their glutathione system. And the way we metabolize glutathione is to, uh, excuse me, metabolize alcohol is, is through a uh, dehydrogenase that it requires glutathione. And, uh, and so you can have uh, severe sequelae from the combination of acetaminophen and, and alcohol. Uh, we've had many people voluntarily try um, lipocytical glutathione for management of headaches um, and self-management of um, self-induced over-exuberant celebration. And we've had many reports, anecdotal reports, of uh, benefit and resolution of uh, these headaches. So Great Prains also offers a whole blood glutathione. 98% of all glutathione is in the whole blood, um, and while less than 2% is in the serum, I mentioned serum earlier, there's a lot of confusion about what's going to change uh, first, and I would refer you to the article on uh, um, my Kern in 2011 um, that's available on our website. 
whole blood samples do not need to be centrifuged. Um, hemolysis does play a role in this um, in terms of getting accurate values, and this has really created a lot of consternation amongst researchers um, in trying to determine uh, what compartment they call it of blood, whether it's serum or the whole blood or the red blood cells themselves that should be monitored. Uh, but you should expect to find 90% of the glutathione in the reduced form in the blood. So I appreciate your uh, joining me this evening. I'm open to some more questions. One